Well, today I've brought with me something uh, quite uh, special um, because uh, it's one of those things that's, that's super, super powerful. Um, it's actually uh, remarkably powerful in the sense that it's made me stop um, and take stock um, uh, immediately uh, in my life. And, um, and I think I'll just, yeah, Steve, maybe if you can bring it, it's, uh, if people can see, Steve comes this side, I've co-opted Steve in, um, I'm sure people on Zoom hopefully can see this. So in here is something exceptionally powerful today. Um, and uh, it's uh, certainly stopped me in my tracks a few times. And, uh, and I'm absolutely certain, farmers may be the little ones, but um, I'm absolutely certain that all of you at some stage have been stopped in your tracks by this very powerful thing that's in here. And, uh, <clears throat> and actually, uh, without exception, um, this, is, this thing in here is not just reserved for, uh, for the likes of our mere mortals. Um, it's also for great men and women that lived before us, great leaders of the world, great women. They've all come to, to have to stop um, with this very powerful thing in here. Um, and even without exception, even Jesus would have been stopped dead in his tracks um, with what's in here. Now, you wonder what that might be. Um, so, Steve, could you open the box and uh, reveal what's inside the box for us, please? Um, that's just another box. Could you open that box and reveal what's in that box, please? Uh, actually, that's another box. <laughs> uh, uh, Steve, could you open that box and reveal what's in the box? <laughs> right. Um, for those who can see and for those uh, probably from home, uh, the box has got ever smaller. Uh, you would anticipate that this thing would be quite enormous to fit in that box, or it had to be super enormous to, to even make Jesus stop in his tracks. Um, but in actual fact, it's, it's right in there. And so I'm going to ask Steve to take it out for us. <laughs> okay, right, Steve. So if you can uh, open that for us. And, uh, and tell us what is attached to the piece. But I have to attach it to the piece. But can you tell us what that is, Steve? Okay. Uh, under the sellotape is one grain of sand. And you probably can't see from there. There's a tiny grain of sand. Great. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. So uh, I'll put that there. So you anticipated in the box it might be something really good. You may ask yourself, well, why? How can a grain of sand stop you and I, even stop Jesus in his tracks. So I'm going to demonstrate that to you today, how that actually happens. So I would like a, a volunteer to see how it can stop you dead in your tracks. Now, I would like, it's, it's a shame that the, the folks at Zoom couldn't join us this morning uh, to, to, uh, to be one of the volunteers, but I think in this occasion they are fortunate not to be uh, so I'm asking again, any volunteers, any hands? Uh, I'm not getting any hands. I've not sold this very well, have I? Oh, I got Sandra. I got Sandra. No, no, Sandra, you can stay. You can stay. Uh, thank you very much. You've got applause. You can stay for there because I need to explain first because if you, to see if you're still willing to be a volunteer after that. Um, I've had Sandra actually uh, volunteer for something beforehand, and she was very brave, and she seemed... If, uh, if brevity is, is, uh, is a measure of character, certainly Sandra wins the first prize every time. So, uh, <laughs> so what, may, what might you think would even stop you and I, the greatest men and women of this world, and Jesus straight in their tracks? Well, Sandra, um, I'm going to take this grain of sand, and if you're willing, I'm going to put it in your eye. So yeah, I, I don't really actually want you to do that. I just wanted to. No, that's fine. Um, 
Who has ever had something in their eye? A grain of sand, an eyelash, who has ever had that? Uh, without exception, most people probably put their hands up. Um, and I can assure you, at least in my case, um, it makes me stop in my tracks. I have no choice but to deal with that grain of sand. No matter who, uh, who's around me or what I'm doing, I have to deal with it, even to the point, and then maybe it's happened to you this before, uh, jolted out uh, uh, awake in the middle of your sleep pattern um, with something in your eye. It just wakes you up, and normally it's an eyelash or something like that. Um, and I would say even for Jesus, if he had a grain of sand in his uh, eye, and I'm not sure if he did or not, but if he certainly, if he uh, experienced and lived in a dry country, you would know there's very good likelihood he would have had a grain of salt in the, uh, a grain of sand in his eye. And he would have had to stop, no matter what he was doing, to deal with that grain of sand. So that grain of sand um, must be dealt with. Um, it stops you, it disables you, and the thing it does very well is distract you to make it the main priority. It makes it the main priority. Um, <clears throat> and that, and it feels, as you all know, this big in your eye. It doesn't actually feel as small as it, it feels this big. And then it makes it a huge priority. Um, you have to focus on it. And so today I just want to dwell a little bit on these things that are small and what they can actually do and what impact they have. And I'll just start a little bit with uh, uh, the world we live in, um, Satan's domain, uh, who's the, the father of this world. And uh, he's very good at taking small stuff and stopping us and distracting us with those small stuff and shifting our focus and priority so that we can must, uh, not look at uh, what uh, God has called us to do, uh, put us in bondage, away from God. So, you know, the, the saying, saying making a mole heap into a mountain, well, that certainly is, is the case. And that's certainly what a grain of salt does in our lives. Is it does exactly that thing. But what it actually does, what that grain of salt does when it's in your eye, it takes all focus away uh, and you have to focus on that. So it's like, that's what the, uh, the enemy does. And, and he, he makes the focus on me. He, he, the whole world is made up of these kind of things I'm going to mention now. Is that the enemy, the devil says, uh, I would like you to put emphasis on these things. And you have to put emphasis on it because I'm going to, like a grain of sand, almost force you to pay attention to these things. So I'm going to bombard you all the time with it. So, and you may have seen and heard that uh, our feelings matter. Um, the, the pursuit of fun and pleasure, isn't that in the forefront of what we hear every day? Things like uh, not wanting to experience discomfort or pain or loss. Um, one of the other things is things like, um, have I got lovely things and material things? Or the must-have things I must have? All the things I don't have and the lack of not having those things. Or, um, or even, the, the, I would say, probably one of our biggest scourges that we see now in our livelihood, in our lifetime now, is this sense of uh, where's my standing in life, my status. Um, the sense of a fear of man or opinion of others, which has uh, brought the sense of self-righteousness. And there's a massive surge what we now see in identity politics and we see in the celebrating uh, unwise people, ungodly people are celebrated in our society today. Um, partly driven by the fear of man. And of course, by pride. Um, and, I, and the question is, is this, God's, uh, is this important in God's eternal kingdom? Is this, has this got value and importance? And most of those things I've mentioned there, if not all of them, actually doesn't. Um, it has no importance. But... That's exactly what the devil and Satan wants to do. Um, like that grain of salt, the lesser things he wants to make more important. So in other words, he makes them so important that you cannot but just focus on that or seemingly makes it so important. Um, so he takes things like um, uh, our insecurities, our flaws, the things we're weak at, and unfortunately he knows them and he exploits them. And he makes that a priority in your life, a distraction. Uh, those small things become such a big distraction that his whole aim is, um, is to damage and destroy. 
you? Um, and what is he do doing in damaging and destroying? And, and in John 10, I'll uh, read that scripture for you. It says, he comes like a thief only to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what he comes and does. And, but Jesus goes further and says, I have come that they may have life and life into the full. So there is, a, there, there, there is an answer to this, but he's come to, to, to change the priority in your life uh, away from Jesus, away from God's focus. Um, he's taking the priorities of your weaknesses and your flaws, and he's blowing them up so that you, who you are in Christ, um, your value and effectiveness as a Christian in your day-to-day -day walk, all of that culminates as uh, for him to, to damage that or destroy it completely um, and keep you away from God. And that's his ultimate goal. For those who don't know God, he tries to keep them away. For those who do know God, he tries even harder to keep you away from God, to undermine you all the time. Um, and some of the prominent places that he attacks us um, is sort of three areas I'll mention, but there's, there's obviously more than that. And there's areas like relationships, our character, self-worth as people and um, with our relationships uh, we all know we've seen it they make television uh, sitcoms with it and it becomes quite a lot of uh, 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 funny comedy as it were where someone just slightly misunderstands so there's a little seed that's sown of discord and people slightly misunderstand that it's blown out of proportion to the point where we all know that it sometimes just splits marriages it breaks up friendships it puts nations against nations, but it normally starts at small seeds, something small that's completely blown out of proportion and taken completely out of proportion. The enemy is very good at doing that. When it comes to our character, um, he loves to focus on the things you're not good at because he knows that's where he can hurt you. Just like that grain of, a grain of sand, it, takes, it really focuses your mind and he plays on those things. He reminds you of your weaknesses and flaws. But also, he plays on the things that are you're good at. And you would say, well, how, how's that? Well, he even uses the things you're really good at to, uh, to sow, sow seeds, small little seeds of proudfulness about it. So, uh, so attacking your character. And then your self-worth, well, he loves preying on our insecurities. He loves playing with, with when you know, he constantly tells us, uh, I'd be surprised that, that all of us don't face that somewhere along the line in our day at least once where the enemy just says you're not good enough. And it doesn't matter on what areas, you know, as a Christian and how you walk and how you honor God, he may say you're not good enough, you're not worthy, you, you can't contribute. It may be within your friendships and your marriage and your work. You mention anything, there's probably on one occasion in the day where that message where the enemy is, is trying to convince you of that very thing is to to use that insecurity you have, even to the point of where he says you don't deserve God's love. You don't deserve God's love. You don't deserve God's forgiveness. Um, God's forgiven you, but uh, then you trip up and uh, do something you shouldn't have done. Uh, you ask God's forgiveness, and now it's the tenth time you've done that in whatever period of time, in the short period of time over your lifetime. You do that again, and he comes and says, you see, you see, I told you, you don't deserve God's love and forgiveness. See, he's forgiven you so many times, you don't deserve it again. And the enemy is very, very good at using those very small things and work away at us. And actually, those are the very, very things that takes up a lot of our attention. Just like that grain of salt, you haven't got a choice but to stop and pay attention to it because he's, he's pieing it on, he's pushing it where it really hurts. So he blows up. And a lot of these things is, is, if you look at it, it's all negative. There isn't any positive in it. It may be painted and flavored like it's very positive and good, but it's always negative. It's got a negative outcome. Um, it's about destruction. It's about taking you away from God. That's, that is his main goal. So now I've gone and shared with you uh, a few of these uh, uh, things, and it sounds quite dramatic and scary and negative, um, you know. So let's just, on a few of these things, let's say, okay, right, let's see God's perspective on this. So the enemy takes the small things, blow them out of proportion, particularly the, the bad or weaker things, 
fools you to believe things that are not important. And I'm particularly talking about things like pride and materialism and fun-loving and seeking fun and pleasure all the time. Um, but let's see God's eternal view on this. Let's see how God views this. Um, so I'll deal with one of the first things, and I think it's important because this one um, uh, plays on you from an external context. So some of the other things you are striving towards, uh, you are uh, internally driven. So things like materialism, a lot of times that's a choice you make. It can't be forced upon you. You can refuse uh, easily to, to take, uh, take it or not to take it. The same with pride. Uh, the pursuit of pleasure, for instance, you can make a choice. But the things where you probably can't make a choice is the area of pain and suffering and loss. A lot of times that can be uh, imposed upon you without you choosing it. So you may ask yourself, um, you know, what's God's perspective on this? Because the enemy certainly uses that element of pain and loss in our lives and suffering to really, it's almost like putting the knife in and, and really driving it uh, further deeper and really accentuating that uh, to the point that he turns it around and saying actually those very pain and losses uh, is, uh, is the result of you not doing something right with God and therefore that's where you've got it and there's no other reason or you see um, God doesn't really love you this is why you have this so he uses that pain and loss but God says something else um, you know those physical things you're struggling with or those emotional pains or loss, and I don't mean loss here in terms of material things. Yes, it can be devastating, like some people in a flood who lose everything, and I understand that. But I'm talking about loss mainly about uh, loved ones, uh, someone or something that you have uh, 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 been very, very dear to, and, and you lose them in your life. That is devastating. It is an overwhelming emotion. Um, and that emotion is so overwhelming, just like that grain of sand, you cannot but have to pay attention to it. And, and the enemy knows now he's got you stopped and paying attention. That is when, when he really wants to attack you. And many a people in, in a time of loss uh, really uh, struggle with why, God, why? Um, and, and a lot of times it's the enemy that that's blinding you to God's perspective, to God's eternal view of that. So uh, a scripture of encouragement. Let me, let me read you a scripture of encouragement. Um, I don't want to talk about all the, the bad, heavy stuff. So let me encourage you. You know, Jesus said, uh, 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 God said that he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. That's in Revelation 21. There'll be, there'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. Uh, for the older things have passed away. So God says it's not going to go on forever. This is a, this God's view is you're going through something that's temporary. N not to diminish it, but he says he's going, you're going through something that's actually temporary. That's my view, God says, on that. It's a temporary thing. And, uh, and God says there's a purpose in it. God says there's an absolute purpose in it. And he promises that. And one of my favorite verses is Romans 8:28. He says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good for those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. So in all things, God says, in all things. Um, so God's view is temporary. Now, when we experience real pain, real emotional pain or that sense of real loss in our lives, um, it, it's no small matter to us. Um, and certainly the enemy doesn't make it a small matter. <clears throat> And God doesn't, uh, doesn't um, diminish the fact that it is something very pertinent and serious in your life. It is. But God says um, it must be viewed in context of eternal consequence and eternal outcome. So it's to see that in that context. Um, and he's really saying to us that, um, you know, amongst the things that we go through, and I'm not going to go into detail about the, 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 the element of suffering and pain and loss. It's really about... Uh, some elements of what God's doing in your life with that, rather than what the enemy is doing with it. Um, and we read in Jeremiah 18, for instance, that uh, um, he talks about he's the potter and, and we're the clay. And God's actually busy to, to uniquely shape you. And, the, and, and some of the ways he uniquely shape you is during times of trial, uh, but particularly during times of uh, pain and loss. Um, and some of the functions for that is 
sort of, I'll mention a few. One is to, to simply move you away from sin. So he wants to work away at those uh, impurities in your life. So he's molding you and he's, he's changing you to become Christ-like, to become like God's character. But, um, but, but sometimes it needs suffering for you to stop and pay attention. Um, otherwise, you will just continue doing that. Um, but also he's preparing you for bigger things, bigger, more challenging tasks. So um, uh, you, you're experiencing whatever you're experiencing in discomfort and pain, maybe for something that's going to be even more challenging. Um, because God says that nothing will overcome you. Uh, he will not allow for where you are in your life that it'll overcome you. And those experiences are to equip you. Uh, and it may not mean for your benefit. It actually may mean for someone else's benefit. It's, uh, it's to minister to someone else further down the line so that you have not just real sympathy with them, but heartfelt empathy and understanding of where they are because you have experienced it yourself in a greater or lesser degree. Um, and it's also to protect us, um, to protect us for, to, to have small doses, almost like an inoculation, like vaccines, we all know about that now. It's just to have those small doses so that when the bigger challenges and struggles come, we can actually cope with them because we've gradually had uh, uh, times of uh, loss and pain uh, in different levels. Um, but also importantly, to keep you away from doing wrong things, and most importantly, for you to focus and put your trust in God. The whole uh, um, precept of what God uses there, that temporary measure, is not for you to focus like the enemy wants to do on what is my feelings, but it's to actually focus on what is eternal, to focus on what is God. Uh, uh, I'll focus on God and your dependency on him through that. Um, and there's a scripture in, in 1 Peter 1 um, where it says, In this you greatly rejoice, though for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proven genuine and may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. There's a purpose. There's a purpose with the trials that we face. And the enemy, the whole purpose is to use that uh, to undermine you and to say that God doesn't love you or God, you see, it's, this is the result of why uh, you shouldn't be following God. So how does God see me? Um, the, other, the other point is, uh, in terms of the self-worth that we were talking about and our character where the enemy, that's one of his favorite places because the person who knows you best is probably you. Um, and that's where the enemy knows to undermine you because you, you don't deep down, nobody else knows you really well. Uh, to a certain degree you do with people who are close to you, but that's the one area that he can undermine because there is no alternative voice to balance that off. Uh, we're in an open friendship when you have a friendship with someone else uh, and things get a little bit out of kill to unbalance. There's someone else in that relationship who can balance that. And, and what he wants to do is he, he wants to say, you're not worthy, uh, God doesn't love you, and therefore that relationship isn't strong enough and doesn't need to be strong enough. Um, you can stand on your own feet. Um, but he also then tells you you're, you're not capable or you're, in, uh, you're uh, inadequate. Um, and I think that's a, a real challenge for us in our Christian lives. We get constantly being undermined of you're not worthy to do these things for God. Um, but I would like to encourage you because God sees, again, has a different perspective on this. Um, and I'd like to remind us who we are in Christ. So, <clears throat> so I'm going to just read a few scriptures, and I'm quite sure some of these would be very familiar to you or just ones you've read in the past and just remind you. So I'm just going to fly through a few here because I just sometimes feel, for me, as I can come up with lots of words and ideas and concepts and, and, and so on, but for me, I sometimes think, the best way to hear what God's got to say is just simply listen and hear his word. So I'm going to just uh, read for you a few things to remind us uh, who we are actually in Christ. 1 Peter 2, but your chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the, the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. Galatians 4, <clears throat> that's verse 6 to 7. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into, uh, in our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, 
in an aid to God. Ephesians 1, 4 to 5, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. And another beloved one from Romans 8, 38 and 39, for I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God and Christ Jesus our Lord. In 1 Peter 1, praise be to God and, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade and kept in heaven for you. The enemy might be telling you in your year you're not worthy, you're incapable, um, you're not important, um, and who are you to, uh, to live a life and proclaim God? Well, God says we are redeemed, we are forgiven, um, we are purchased at a price, a very expensive price. We are uh, co-heirs with Christ, a holy priesthood. We are set aside. Um, but for me, the most striking one is we're uh, a child of God. We are adopted as a child of God. Now, in UK law, I don't know about other countries, but certainly in UK law, when, when a child is adopted and they go through the process and they, they're in front of the court, and on that day when they are officially signed over to, to the new adoptive parents, um, that's, there's a legal document that takes place, almost a contract with the state, as it were. Um, and that child then receives that new parent's name. They receive the name of that new parent. Um, they are now called by that surname or name. And also, they are considered in law as a, as, as a birth child would be, so that they have exactly the same position and rights. Now, that m may not sound that important, but in the context of children under care, for instance, uh, and some who have experience with that, would know that the state can intervene at any stage. Uh, but once you've got your own birth children, the state has to have a very good reason to intervene in that. Uh, they can't just come and take those children away. They can't re remove them. You have complete uh, uh, um, parenthood over that child as if it's your birth child once legally adopted. That's just the UK law. I don't know about other countries and, and the strictness and or, or how they view it. But certainly, when you're adopted, that is an absolute clear indication, a contract and sealed. And that's our adoption, but a thousand times, a million times more, that that adoption and, and sonship and daughtership we have with God. We're uh, called Christians. We've adopted his name. We are called Christians to some degree uh, as if we've adopted his name. But also, uh, as we've just seen there and read there, he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He'll keep us in our hand. Nothing can remove us from us. We are now his. We belong to him. Um, <clears throat> every need we have, we are his children. He will take care of. Um, after all, we're sons and daughters of a king now. We have been adopted by a king, not just a other mere person, but by a king. And if, if I was a prince, or I uh, almost said if I was a princess, I'm not quite a princess, but if I... Uh, if if you're a prince or a princess living uh, in a kingdom, the king is certainly going to make sure, and the queen, to, when they raise their prince and princesses, to be equipped to, to, to rule one day. That's what they're going to do. So the sons and, and days of old were taught uh, warfare and strategy and understanding, but also how to rule the kingdom. And so were princesses. They had a role and responsibility. They were taught these things. They were educated how to be uh, rulers and kings and queens. And God does exactly the same for us. We, uh, the enemy undermines us and he says, no, you're not worthy. You, you, you haven't got a place. No, you're, you're a son and daughter of the living God, the king of kings. And he is preparing you, even as you sit here today, even as the hardships you face or anything you, you're going through your life, God is constantly using that and preparing you um, to, to fulfill the role he's called you to be because you now belong to him. And then very importantly, this is not our home. Um, 
And I first-hand experienced that to some degree because I left what I considered my home and only came here temporary um, to study. And then eventually I've settled here and now I can call this my home. It took me a while to actually get my head around that. Even in this country, I, I, and I started to be torn. And they, I can't tell you the day, but there was a transition when I suddenly called this home and, and where I came from in South Africa was not home anymore. Um, and I don't know. But now I see and I view, I live for here, my goals are here, my motivation is here, uh, my thinking is here, my family is here. Um, yes, my loved ones are there where they are. They still matter in that context. But we are not from here. Our home isn't here. The kingdom God called us for isn't here. And we're just passing through. What's the enemy do? And I'll re remind you of the things I said early on. He reminds you that the things that matter is what other people are saying. The people of this kingdom are saying things. He wants you to pay attention to that. He says, look at all these wonderful things you could have in this kingdom. And he wants you to pay attention to that. And God says, no, there's an eternal view here. You're just passing through. You're just passing through. These things are not yours. They are not what is predestined for you. This is not my kingdom. You're just passing through. This is temporary. We need to start having an eternal view of how God <clears throat> sees things. The enemy sees small things and makes them big things, as I said before, and he, and he pesters and attacks us with that. How do I know these promises? Well, God teaches us that. He teaches us these promises. Uh, there's uh, the great scripture, the great promise we have. Um, for God says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. It's Jeremiah 29, and it's a scripture we all heard a lot, sometimes quoted out of context, uh, because God was really talking to the nation of Israel and to say that they were in a dire place, and God said later on, I'm going to save you, I'm going to pull you out of this, which he did, as he promised, but also, even greater, he said, I will send a Messiah, even greater, because that doesn't just matter to Israel, it matters to the whole of the world, it matters to us generations later. And God says he cares for those. He looks after those. That's a promise he makes to us. So he teaches us that, and we know that because we read his word. That's what we read. And some of the other things I've just read to you, that is found in his word. If you, if you are having doubts, if you don't want the enemy's voice to take hold and plant uh, unworthiness in your head, the best place to fight that is to read God's word. Go and read these scriptures. Just read them over and over every day. If you, even if you just do that, uh, they will be implanted in your heart, and the enemy will find it extremely hard to convince you otherwise. Because the next point is, God shows us. The Bible says in Romans 8, uh, the Spirit himself tested and advised with our spirit that we are God's children. So even as the enemy, enemy keeps trying, as long as you, you are uh, uh, walking closely with God, um, spending time in God's word, understanding who you are in Christ, um, God's spirit will also testify, not just with your spirit for you personally, but in your life and everything you do. And it'll be a testament to others as well. Um, now, there's a, a, a great scripture, and if there's one uh, scripture you can take away today, and I would like you to almost inscribe on your heart and remember it's uh, 1 John 3 verses 1. Now, for me, it almost sums up everything that I'm talking about today, but behold, what manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. We're in the world, the enemy is there, the world has not got a perception of the things of God. And that's why we are always attacked for the things that we have in God, because they are eternal. The view is eternal. Um, so, and, and a few small things uh, and small people over the history that we know biblically that God has done great things with. Uh, that, because why I'm saying small people and small things? Because we can so easily believe or think that we have no value now compared to other people we see, to great Christian leaders or great Christian men before us. Uh, women who've done remarkable things. How can I live up to any of that? How can I make a difference here today? No, I can't, and I shouldn't. Um, we think of Gideon, uh, who was faced with enormous odds, and God used just a small handful of men 
to overcome an enormous enemy. Uh, think of David, the shepherd. Um, you know, these are all uh, very good examples. He was a shepherd. He was the lesser of the brothers, the last one down the line. He was short. He was a shepherd, no soldier, and, uh, and certainly not trained to fight any battles. Um, and, and he defeated a mighty warrior like Goliath. Um, and then became one of the greatest kings, one of the greatest men. Um, a man after my own heart, God declares. Uh, you know, and, and in the eyes of man, he wasn't important. Uh, Paul shared with us uh, a few weeks ago about the, the remarkable life of Esther and where she came from. And, um, you know, to, to be adopted almost and cared by uncle, do you think, make an impact and, and save her, um, her nation? Uh, and be in a position to be that, um, and you could have said, well, she, she wasn't an important person at all, uh, but God used her. Um, and then we think about Peter. Um, God says, you're the rock that I'm going to build the church on. Um, and if it wasn't for Peter's obedience and for the disciples' obedience, and they were just fishermen, they weren't educated, uh, highly trained people, they were just people like you and I. Um, and you and I are sitting here today because they were obedient, and they just did what God said. Um, and God built a church in her. Um, and in John 6, we read about Jesus, the fishes and loaves, and it's one we share a lot at, at Junior Church, uh, the, the five fishes and two loaves. <clears throat> and uh, Jesus says, um, when we go and read it in John 6, he says, uh, bring what you could find. God and, and brought loaves and fishes. And then uh, Jesus said, okay, um, I'll bless it. And then it was multiplied, and many people ate from that. And, and there was even lots and lots left, I think 12 uh, baskets, if I remember right, left of that. Um, and it's interesting when you, uh, when you actually look at the, that uh, well-known uh, event in the Bible, that Jesus doesn't ask us, um, doesn't ask the disciples, okay, what, what have we got? And they bring in the fish um, and the bread, and he thinks, uh, I'm sorry, all of these people, I've got to, uh, and then he said, call the disciples over and say, look, guys, I don't think this is quite cutting it. Um, could you run off to Tesco there and just let's go and get some stuff? Let's go and get some, go and buy some pasta and go and buy some ham and, oh, maybe not ham because they're Jewish, so that maybe is not the right one to say. Buy, buy some, uh, some more bread and some lovely cheese and, um, and while you're there, get, get a few pavlovas. That'll do it for all of the crowds and, and, a, and a few crates of uh, fizzy drink. No, God didn't say that. He didn't say that at all. He didn't ask for high fluting fancy stuff. He just said, ask him, what have you got? And he blessed it and he multiplied it. So you may feel insignificant or small or inconsequential or feel like you have no value or ability, but what does Jesus say? Um, he says, come as you are. Whatever you have, whatever stage you are in your life, whatever ability you have, whatever knowledge you have, God says, Bring what, what you have, and I will bless that, and I will multiply that beyond your expectation, beyond your understanding, um, even to the point of not even in your lifetime will you see that fruit. Um, and, and I can witness that. I witnessed that on the Alpha course, I think this week or before, that my grand prayed um, and lived her life as a Christian if, and never saw her children come to the Lord, but all four her children came to the Lord eventually, but she was consistent and persistent. Uh, and because of that, um, their children's children, and now her great-grandchildren, uh, swathes of them are coming to the Lord. Um, and so you don't always see the result of that. So don't live for what you can see, but have an eternal view. You know, God does, uh, uh, raises a very interesting point. He says, give me little. So he doesn't expect of you mega things. He just said, give me a little. I'll bless it and I'll multiply it. And what better analogy than that, that God uses than in Matthew 5? Um, and this is one of my favorite things. It says, you are the salt of the earth and you're the light of the world. And what better small things to use to illustrate who we are? Um, and as an illustration, um, in terms of the light, uh, many years ago I was sort of... I, in my mid-20s, um, a bunch of my brother and a bunch of our friends, we decided to, um, to, to go into this mountain and do some mountaineering and treasure hunting. Why am I saying that? Well, my dad brought us up with these fantastic stories where he lived. He lived near this 
village, and there's a massive mountain range behind him. And he grew up with stories being told by some of the older guys and the older folks that years ago during the war, many years ago, people hit very special old front loader guns in caves there, never been found. And when they did that, they also hit some coins and special gold and stuff and treasure there, but it's never been found. And countless people try to find and look for this. And obviously, as little, little lads growing up, I thought, well, wow, this is a fantastic adventure. We want to find out about it. We want to do it. So when we were a bit more grown up, we said, well, let's give it a go. Let's, let's make it an adventure. Let's go and have a fun. Let's go and do a bit of mountaineering. But at the same time, let's see if we can find these treasures. So our goal was to go into this mountain range area. And, uh, and one of our big uh, missions was let's go cave hunting, look for caves. And we did. We, we found quite a lot of caves, some uh, not so great, some small, not big. But there was this one particular cave we found, and actually we didn't find it. We stumbled upon it. And literally by our feet, very small hole, overgrown, you couldn't even see it. By chance we found it. And this little hole, you could just crawl in and crawl in a very steep, downward way that you climb down in the cave. So we had to rope ourselves up and climb very carefully down. And then went deeper and deeper and deeper into the mountain. Um, and to one point we thought, well, are we going to actually reach anything or is this just a chasm that's just sort of like a tunnel? And eventually we came into this uh, cavern or cave. I would say it's, it's about to where Maitland and Steve is. So for those on Zoom, it's probably about a garage, a garage and a half size. Um, and, and not very high, very small chamber that we were in. And, and we said, yes, this must be it. This must be one of the places. Let's have a look around. And so we were very excited to look around. Of course, nothing. The only thing we found was an old skeleton of a little antelope that probably got stuck in there and died. So we were a bit disappointed, but still excited about the idea of being in a cave. But one of the things we did is um, we switched off all the lights and we kept quiet just to have the experience. Um, and... Uh, it's amazing if you've never been really in that situation is you're where it is so quiet and so dark. Your eyes are wide open, absolutely wide open. And you strain your eyes. In normal darkness, there's always a little bit of light that sort of just gives you a flavor of what's going on. But it is so, so dark. The saying of your hand in front of you is literally, you just cannot see a single, there's not a iota of light in there, absolutely pitch dark. Now, we were over there for two, about two weeks. Uh, we had to preserve our battery lives. For our, for our, so we, we brought candles along because we didn't have enough batteries. So we said, okay, right, let's lit a candle. And so we lit one candle and put it in the middle of this cave. And I would say um, it was absolutely amazing how much light one little candle gave. Um, and, and it really reminded me of the scripture and to the extent that that little light that that candle gave was enough for us to do and explore and spend time in that cave for, for the short period of time we were there. Um, and you know, that was quite, quite interesting. The darkness that was so overwhelming, the one thing it didn't have a say in, it had no choice. When that light came on, it had to retreat. It had no choice. And it didn't matter how small that light was, even at times when the candle just, just flickered like it was going out and the light dipped and the light was very little and the darkness was absolutely potentially overwhelming, it simply could not overcome the light. It could never overcome the light. Once that light's on, it couldn't be overcome. And the same goes for salt. You only need a little bit of salt to flavor food. And I'm sure we've, we've all... Uh, read that passage and reminded us, of, us that if we eat food that hasn't got salt in, we only need a very little amount. Um, and it just has to be added in, and it just transforms the taste of, of the food. Now, it's used in all sorts of manners, uh, 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 the analogy of salt in terms of that's our influence in the world. God asks us to, to just flavor things around us. That's we, we hear. To, to flavor and, and put the goodness uh, of God in the world and uses us like the light just to shine. Um, but it's very important that we are in the world, not like we separate ourselves like some monks do. They separate themselves completely from the world. You must be like salt. You have to be thrown in the food to actually make it palatable. You have to be amongst a people. Um, God wants you to. And, and the other thing you have to do with salt is it's, it's got to be destroyed. as It's got to dissolve um, before it actually has value. 
Um, so we've got to lose ourselves in God and actually dissolve ourselves in the environment. But it only takes minute, small amounts, like the candle, only a very small amount of light that is needed to drive enormous amount of dark away. It's only a very small amount of salt that makes all the difference in, in how that food tastes. Um, and, and really today, I just want to emphasize that small, God blesses and multiplies. Um, God can use every single one of us, no matter where we are. Um, he's, he's prepared a special time and place, and that's where you are now. You, you are prepared to be here where you are. And I don't mean literally here today or where you're going to spend the next day, but amongst the people that you are called to be, uh, the family, uh, the, the family who are unsaved, but also the saved people to encourage others, to help people, but also amongst friends and places where you work. Uh, and, and God doesn't ask you to be some mega Christian crusader in your life. That's not what he's asking you. He may call upon some to be that, but he's not asking you to be that. He's just asking you to be salt and light, just a little bit. Just live your life for God, um, because he's uniquely prepared you. And it's simple. You just have to draw near to God. Uh, we've seen over the, the, the past weeks uh, uh, the message about prayer, which is fundamental to that process. Um, spend time with God. Um, learn about the word, learn about who you are in Christ, because that is where the strength of uh, God lies, is in that. Um, have an eternal mindset. See it how God sees it. Don't see this temporary passing, you're just passing through. Uh, but most importantly, and Steve touched on that last week, uh, and you can read in the book of James, that um, uh, faith without works is, is pointless, it's got no value. We have to um, apply what we learn. Uh, and, and this is very, very important. We, I can share with you today these things. I can tell you about you only need a little and God can do a lot with it. It doesn't matter what it is. But if you don't actually go out there and step out and apply these things, then no matter what knowledge you have, um, it, 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 it has no value if you don't apply it. Um, someone once said, knowing is not doing. And I'm just going to say it, knowing is not doing, and, and that's, you know, you can know everything, everything about the Bible, but if you don't implement any of it, um, it is no value. And, and our lives should be evidenced by that. Our life should be the evidence of that we not just know, but we are actually do, uh, we apply what God has asked us to do. So, um, I've probably rambled on long enough, I've distracted you long enough. Um, I've, I've achieved what the sand, uh, uh, little sand grain has done, and I've kept the focus uh, on you. Some of you have fallen asleep, but I'm sure if you had a grain of salt in, in you, you wouldn't have fallen asleep. I'm only joking. Um, main point is don't be distracted uh, by life and supposedly important agendas of what the world is throwing us. Don't get distracted like that sand grain. We're just passing through. Um, keep, keep an eternal focus uh, on this. Keep a focus on God and Jesus only. Um, and Jesus reminds us, uh, or God reminds us, as first seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all other things will be added unto you. Make Jesus first, and remember the small things Jesus can multiply.